has concluded. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? I give the call to the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister stated before the last election, and I quote, if I'm given the great honour of holding high office as Prime Minister, I won't seek to blame anyone else. I'll accept the responsibility that goes with that job. Will the Prime Minister accept responsibility and admit he has broken his promise to provide cheaper mortgages and to cut power bills by $275 per year, a promise that he made on 97 occasions. And I give order. Members on my left, I give the call. The member for Hume, I remind all members not to interject before a minister or prime minister has even begun an answer. And if they continue to do that, they will be warned and asked to leave the chamber. I give the call to the prime minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, those, those opposite won't take responsibility for anything that they did when they were in government. Nothing. The fact is that there was, there was, there was a pay increase. That there was a price increase for energy scheduled, scheduled by those opposite. Not only did they not take responsibility for it, they hid it. They hid it through a special regulation to make sure that the Australian people couldn't find out. Couldn't find out. But what, uh, what others have, uh, have said about energy is this. The Business Council of Australia. Mr Speaker, he's at it again. He's at it again. Order. He, tr he tries. He the was supposed to be nice, Leader Peter, of the Nationals. but he can't survive to five past two without resorting the to the old buffet. Order. The Leader of the Opposition. It's far too much noise on my left. The Member for Barker is warned. I'll hear from the Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr Speaker, on relevance, all I interjected was, can anybody trust a word this man says? No. There's not a point of order. That is not. The Prime Minister is in order to continue with the answer. And we heard in silence. He has the call. Mr. Speaker, what we've just seen is one question asked by the Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition. By the Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition will cease interjecting. And the Leader in between, of the Opposition. In between the interjections, the order. interjections from the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, he then stands up and asks a different the question. McEwen, a different question, while speaking about integrity and responsibility, and taking into account what people say. He can't keep his word from one minute past two to two minutes past two. That's what we just saw. Order. That's what we just saw for the leader of the opposition. Order. But I'm asked about responsibility. Members on my left. And the shadow minister opposite the member for, uh, for Home Affairs had uh, something to say about responsibility during, during the week. Uh, she was asked about the fact that they not only had one minister sworn into her portfolio, they had another as well, because the member for Cook put in her extra. Order. And she said this, but it's not OK to behave in the way that a former prime minister and others have in relation the to keeping information a secret. Order. Order. So far, so Order. good. The Prime Minister will, Prime Minister will pause. When members on my left cease interjecting, I will hear from the member for McPherson. Thank you, Speaker. I did absolutely say Resume that. So seat. now maybe he can move on and answer the question. Resume your seat. Been... Resume your seat. Re resume your seat. The member for McPherson is a long-term member of Parliament. First question. The Prime Minister is in order. If this behaviour continues, people will be asked to leave the, the chamber immediately without warning. The Prime Minister has the call. Yeah. Because she went on to say, I think it's just extraordinary. And then all stacking up so far, Shadow Minister is pretty right. Then she said, However, I think it's very disappointing that this information is coming to light now. Move for Deacon. That's what she had to say. And then it comes to the responsibility bit. 
and it does reflect very poorly on Prime Minister Albanese. So, this Prime Minister appoints not one but two people in her portfolio, and it reflects badly on me. That says everything. That says everything about your incapacity to take responsibility for anything. Concluded. Order. When the House comes to order, the, the Minister for Skills, the, the Minister for Infrastructure, the Member for Herbert, when the House comes to order, I'll hear from the Member for Blair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. What are the benefits of acquiring and building nuclear powered submarines for local industry, for jobs, and for the economy? Order. Give the call to the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Defence. I uh, thank the member for his question and acknowledge the member as one of the great champions Order. of defence in this House. Uh, Mr. Speaker, nuclear powered submarines are the most complex machines that humanity has ever built, more complex than the Saturn V rocket or any of the engineering around Apollo, more complex even than the Space Shuttle. And at the heart of the AUKUS agreement is a commitment for Australia to establish the fourth production line in our three countries, which will build a nuclear-powered submarine following on from Huntington's and Electric Boat in the United States and BAE in Great Britain. This production line will be one of the most significant centres of technology in our country. In fact, it will be one of the most significant centres of engineering in the world. It will see 20,000 jobs directly created over the next 30 years, $6 billion of investment over the next four years, $30 billion of investment through to the 2050s. And while the production line will be based at the Osborne Naval Yards in Adelaide, in order for us to build nuclear-powered submarines in Australia, we will need to rely on our entire industrial base, which will see opportunities generated in every state in the Federation. And, Mr Speaker, we absolutely need this. The Harvard Index of Economic Complexity is a measure which has at one end of it the most high-tech manufacturing, sophisticated services economy, which turns out to be Japan. And at the other end, it has the most basic subsistence economy. It's not quite, but it is almost an index of modernity. And after the lost decade from those opposite, Australia now sits 91st on that the index, sandwiched Fisher. between Namibia and Kenya. Now, if we're to hand on to our grandchildren in the middle of this century the prosperity that we enjoy now, then the great national task for us is to climb that technological ladder, because where lies modernity lies prosperity. And building nuclear-powered submarines is one of the great ways in which we can do this, because this project will be on the same scale as the Snowy Hydroelectric Scheme. And just as the it Member for Deakin, uh, transformed our economy the Deakin, in the 50s and 60s, and so to too will, will building leave. submarines transform our economy in this century. And in elevating our technological base, we will generate and produce a transformational capability for, for our Warner. defence force, which will enable us to hand on to our kids and to our grandkids a much more self-reliant nation. Give the call to the Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister advise the House of the following? What the interest rate was 10 months ago compared to today? How much the average household electricity bill was? Mr Speaker, the Order. member for Sydney is shrieking so loudly the that I cannot hear. Yeah, the member, members on my right and left are not helping the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. The Deputy the Leader of the Opposition will be heard in silence. That means before the Prime Minister or the, whoever the question is directed to, they will be heard in silence as well. Give the call to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister advise the House of the following? what the interest rate was 10 months ago compared to today, 
how much the average household electricity bill was 10 months ago compared to today, and what the rate of inflation was 10 months ago compared to today. Why do Australian families always pay more under Labor? Yeah, yeah. Order. The Prime Minister has the call. The Minister for the Environment will cease the dejecting. Well, I, I, I almost feel like channelling the member for Melbourne at this point in time. It's got to be said, uh, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, because the, the childishness Order. of those opposite just show day after day their incapacity to actually be a genuine alternative government for the country. Because the fact is, the fact is that inflation is a global phenomenon. Uh, that has led to an increase in costs, including which began on their watch, began on their watch uh, with the first uh, of the interest Order. rate increases. And uh, since then, of course, we continue to have the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We continue to have inflationary pressure on the economy. But those opposite. Those opposite have voted against every single measure that's been aimed at providing assistance. They voted against the $1.5 billion in direct bill relief that we put in. The Prime Minister will pause. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition asked a question about inflation. The Prime Minister is talking about inflation. So I'll give her the call. Mr Speaker, I know numbers aren't the Prime Minister's strong resume, suit. No, resume but your seat. Were... Resume your seat. No, I'm going to take action on this. I'm going to take... No. The... No. Order. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition has abused standing orders in a most grievous way, and she will leave the chamber under 94A. The Prime Minister will be heard in silence. It will be a, waste, a, a wasted one hour for the Deputy Leader because she can't call caucus members against this bloke while they're all in here. The Prime Minister will return to the question. So, order! Order! Members on my left and right, the Prime Minister will return to the question. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, order! What this, government, what this government have been doing is taking measures to put downward pressure on inflation. And the, the member asked a question about inflation some months ago when they were in office. And I'd ask them to give consideration as to whether the Mar March budget that they handed down was inflationary or deflationary. Did it contribute more cash into the economy or less cash into the economy? Did it facilitate higher interest rates or lower interest rates? Because, because what they did, what they did in the lead up to an election, when they were so desperate, when they were so desperate, is promise a whole range of measures that all ended in May. Many of them, many of the measures that they put in place, many of the measures that they put in place ended on June 30 or end next year. On June 30, when you look at the measures of Order. what we have to deal with, with the challenge going forward, uh, measures such as the amazing work being done by Julie Inman Grant, do we really think that's going to end on June 30 next year? Because that's when the funding ends. That's the sort of nonsense budget that those opposite have put together. That is the nonsense Order. that they put together. The Prime Minister's so time the fact is, has. And, 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 and the, the, members time, the Prime Minister's time has concluded. Order. Back to you from the member for Boothby. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Defence Industry. What job opportunities will the AUKUS submarine agreement provide, and how will the Albanese Labor government support workers to access these opportunities? Hey, good question. Call to the Minister for Defence Industry and the Minister for International Development in the Pacific. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for Boothby for her question and her passionate interest in this issue. 
The truth is, Mr Speaker, that the AUKUS Pillar 1 announcement will produce around 20,000 high-paying, secure jobs for Australians, and they will be spread throughout the entire nation. In Order. Adelaide, for example, we will see 4,000 jobs building the construction yard and another up to 5,500 jobs building the actual submarine, importantly, twice the amount that would have been uh, allocated for building the attack class. In Western Australia, we will see 3,000 jobs upgrading HMAS Stirling and another 500 jobs sustaining submarine rotational force west. Importantly, Order. across both those great states, we will see 2,500 jobs sustaining our Virginia class and then SSN AUKUS. All good paying secure jobs. Importantly, we will see across the entire nation 1,900 scientists, engineers and technicians employed. This is probably the greatest new demand for scientists this country has seen in a long way. Uh, we'll also see 4,500 jobs across Navy and Defence. And these job figures, the 20,000 jobs we're talking about, doesn't even include the supply chains. Companies like Talos and Rydalmere, who could supply sonar components, Pacific Marine Batteries supplying batteries out of Osborne. All great jobs, all driven by this nation-building visionary announcement by the Albanese Labor government. Now, I'm asked how we will find the workers for these jobs. That's a really important question. And the answer is simple. We will train them. We will train young Australians for these jobs, and it starts now. And that's why we've allocated $6 billion Herbert. over the next four years to start that effort and $30 billion over the life of the program to train young Australians. An apprentice starting their training tomorrow could work their entire career in this industry helping safeguard the nation. We've committed to a skills academy in Adelaide that will train hundreds of apprentices each and every year, and we're also supporting science and engineering degrees. Already supporting over 50 Australians in new specialised courses in the United States and United Kingdom, and helping establish new tertiary courses in nuclear engineering at UNSW and nuclear science at ANU. This is all critical to delivering the greatest capability uplift the Australian Defence Force has seen, as well as modernising our def defence and manufacturing industries. This is an investment in the young people of Australia to help defend this nation. And I'm so proud to be part of a government that's delivering this. 20,000 jobs that will secure their future and help secure the security of the nation going forward. Before I call the member for Mayo, I'm pleased to advise the House that in the gallery today is Councillor Mark Jamison, the Mayor of the Sunshine Coast Council and the President of the Local Government Association of Queensland, and Mr Lance McCallum, the State Member for Van Damber and Assistant Minister in the Queensland Government. A warm welcome to you all. And I give the call to the member for Mayo. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communications. Australians lose more than $25 billion a year to gambling. This harm is exacerbated by the use of credit cards for online gambling, meaning Australians are gambling with borrowed money. My question is, when will you ban credit card use in online gambling? Good question. Give the call to the Minister for Communications. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for her question and acknowledge her ongoing advocacy in this area. The focus of the Albanese government, as with all kinds of harms in this area, is harm minimisation. That's why we are taking an evidence-based approach to this issue, including being informed by the most reliable evidence as it arises through the current House of Representatives Standing Committee inquiry into these very issues. I would point out to the member that, in addition to the issue of credit cards, which has been considered widely and also has been the subject of several inquiries. We are currently considering the options that are available. We have long engaged with the banking sector, uh, with various advocates, and including our regulators in terms of what measures can be taken for amendments in this area, which will provide the necessary levels of harm minimisation. I expect to say more on that very soon, but I do assure the member 
that not only are we very alive to this, we are implementing the recommendations and that framework that is currently there in relation to consumer protections, including on the 31st of this month, where consistent revised advertising measures come into place. So I am working very closely, including with my colleagues uh, and including uh, the Minister for Social Services, who has shared responsibility um, in this area, including my uh, colleagues in relation to Treasury matters as they relate to banks, to bring about meaningful change in this area, which ensures that those harm minimisation objects are well realised. But I do stress to the member we will have uh, more to say on this very soon, and I look forward to engaging with her as we take this forward. Call to the member for Morton. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Following last week's AUKUS announcement, what is the Albanese Labor government doing to strengthen ties with our regional neighbours and friends, particularly in the Pacific? Call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for Morton for his question and for his ongoing interest in our relations uh, in the Pacific region. Uh, AUKUS is about promoting stability, security and prosperity in our region. Yeah, yeah. We are investing in our capabilities on defence, but we're also investing very heavily in our relationships in the region as well. And that's why on the way home from the AUKUS announcement in San Diego, I visited Fiji in order to, one, congratulate the new Prime Minister, Prime Minister Rambuka, on his election at the end of last year but also to talk with him about the ongoing relationship that we have with our Pacific neighbours. Because we know that the government inherited a relationship that was in a bad state. Uh, we know that that occurred prior to uh, the election uh, with the issue in the Solomons with a breakdown in credibility and relationships. Uh, because the entry fee for good relations in the Pacific is action on climate change. Uh, they take that issue uh, more seriously than any other because it's a threat to their very existence. And that's why uh, these relationships are so important. Now, I also thank the Prime Minister of Fiji for uh, his support and work in putting back together the Pacific Island Forum. Uh, we had had a breakdown in the relationships <coughs> with the forum, and not all of the nations uh, attending uh, the forum that I did, hosted by Fiji uh, last year. But uh, the rejoining of Kiribati to the Pacific Island Forum is very important to put the Pacific family back together. Uh, we are investing in a stable and secure region. Uh, we have a signed security agreement with Vanuatu. Uh, we have committed to conclude another one with Papua Order. New Guinea. And in Order. January, I was the first uh, non PNG citizen to ever address their parliament Order, in Port land. Moresby. And I thank Prime Minister Marape uh, for that great honour. Uh, we have also signed a bilateral partnership uh, with the Cook Islands. We have hosted in just uh, nine months uh, seven, tomorrow will be eight, uh, Pacific le leaders. When Tomorrow, the Leader of the Opposition will join me uh, on the forecourt to welcome uh, the Prime Minister of Samoa as an official guest, and I'll host her uh, at the Lodge uh, tomorrow night. Uh, these relationships are very important for Australia's future. They are important uh, for the region and will continue to work constructively. And I pay tribute to the work of uh, Senator Wong and Minister Conroy in particular for the work that they have done in this region. Give the call to the member for Hume. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister confirm that around half of fixed-rate mortgages will end this year? With these interest rate rises, an Australian family with a $500,000 mortgage will have to find an extra $920 every month just to keep up with repayments. Why do Australian families always pay more under Labor? Can we call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for Hume uh, for his question. Uh, question four, as, uh, as predicted. Uh, well, the, uh, the, the, member, the, the member asks about interest rates. 
And uh, a number and a number of questions today and yesterday and previous sitting weeks, I'm asked about what happened and as if the circumstances changed completely before the election and after the election. But this is what his leader, his leader said uh, before the election. We know where these pressures are coming on. We know that the pressures of rising costs of living, the pressures on interest rates are coming from not just the war in Ukraine, which has caused an energy price shock, the likes of which we have not seen for many decades, but secondly, the disruptions to supply chains. Now that is coming from the pandemic. We are still feeling the effects of the rather extraordinary economic times that we are living in. That was the member for Cook just before the election, less than a month before the election. But the member would have uh, Australians believe, watching this, that it was all hunky-dory, that there was no inflation, there were no supply chain issues until there was a change of government. But it's just not true. It's just not true, as he himself uh, said uh, as recently as last September, where he spoke about interest rates bucking decades of downward trends and spoke about the inflationary environment. Uh, but he says one thing in here and a different thing. Hmm. Well, I haven't called you yet. I had a suspicion it would be that. Um, Prime Minister was talking about interest rates. The question was about interest rates. I'm going to hear from the member for Hume on a point of order. Yeah, relevance, Mr Speaker. The question was very specific. Why do Australians always pay more under Labor? No. I'm going, to hear, I'm going to hear from the Leader of the House. Um, Mr Speaker, just a point of order. It's a deliberate abuse, an absolute deliberate abuse. And he added, like, if you want to specify where you think something is not being relevant, you specify where you think where the question... No. Simply running a slogan for a second time okay. doesn't point to standing orders, and they Give know that. Seat. The Prime Minister's in order. The member for Hume, if it happens again, you'll be asked to leave immediately. Is that clear? Give the call to the Prime Minister. Thanks, Mr Speaker. And, and, uh, and yesterday, uh, the member for Hume uh, said, that, uh, said that half of uh, mortgages uh, would, uh, would change. Today, I like, it's just all over the shop. And, and the truth is... The, 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 tr the truth is, the truth is, that the changes to interest rates began on their watch. The, in, it, the inflationary, the Order. inflationary pressures, Order. the inflationary pressures had yeah, been there the in the economy for for a period of time, building up due to, as the former Remember prime Deacon. minister said, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and also and also the supply chain issues that emerged from the pandemic. Now, they want to just wish those away, uh, but you can't just wish these, these things away. Way. You have to act on them, and that's why my government is acting on them. Yeah. Give a call to the member for Chisholm. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Why is the safeguard mechanism important to Australia's future, and what is standing in the way of getting it done? Yeah. Give a call to the Prime Minister. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, today's report from the IPCC is a sobering reminder of the urgency of addressing climate change. And the Australian people understand uh, there's a need to act. Last May, they sent a clear message that the decade of denial needed to end and we needed to act on climate change. Uh, we needed to act in order to seize the opportunities for job creations and new industries uh, that will come. They were decade, they, those opposite had a decade of refusal to acknowledge that the cheapest form of new investment is renewables. We had, we had time after time people standing up here uh, talking about how Liddell was going to stay open and all these things were going to happen, and, and, and none of it did, of course. They talked about building a new coal-fired power station at Collinsville. They funded a study uh, with the actual proponents of, of that private sector project 
using taxpayer funds, but of course that didn't happen either. Business want certainty, and that's why they want the safeguard mechanism to be carried. How do we how do we do that? We need the mechanism that was in fact put in place originally uh, by the former government. But not only are they so committed to saying no to everything and becoming a no coalition, uh, they're even saying no to their own policies. The manager will resume his seat. I'm just going to ask the Prime Minister to refer to the coalition as the coalition. The ambulance raced up there, Mr. Speaker. Prime Minister, return to the Can question. Can I say the um, order that the business community order. Order. are crying Minimum out on my left. for certainty? The chief executive of the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Andrew McKellar, said this: "For the sake of certainty and the achievement of our emissions reduction goals, the safeguard mechanism must pass Parliament." And just this morning, the former Energy Security Board Chair, Kerry Schott, appointed by those opposite, not by us, yep. appointed by those opposite, the former coalition government, said it would be a great shame, in fact, it would be really awful if the safeguard mechanism didn't get up. It really must be passed to be able to meet the 43 per cent target the government has set. But those opposite just stand in the way. They are so determined to say no to absolutely everything, they're now even saying no to their own policy, in spite of the fact that the Leader of the Opposition told the Financial Review Conference that all these businesses Order. were saying they were OK with them saying no. The truth is that they can't name any, any of the significant industry uh, groups who, who are saying anything other than put this through. AIG, Aki, Business Council of Australia all know that this has got to get done. Call, give a call to the honourable member for River Arena. Yeah. Order. Yeah. Order. <laughs> That's popular right. demand, obviously. My que the member for River Arena has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories. It has been 10 months since the federal election and five months since the budget. Why haven't local councils been given the eligibility criteria and funding guidelines for Labor's promised Growing Regions program? It's important. Is this just another Labor broken promise to regional Australians? Call to the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories. Thanks very much uh, to the uh, Shadow Minister for his question. I know, uh, like all regional Australians, we are very keen to represent our regions. Uh, as you know, uh, the Growing Regions program is part of this government's measures of integrity and bringing integrity back into the grants program after years and years Order. of pork barrelling and rorting on the part Order. of the former government. Members so we left. are taking our time to make sure that the guidelines are the best they can possibly be. We are undertaking consultation currently Order. with the regional development sector, and I'll have more to say about the announcement and opening of the program shortly. The member for Page. Here from the member for Bean. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Why is the safeguard mechanism critical for business certainty? What are the risks of this certainty not being provided? Yeah. Give the call to the Treasurer. Thanks, Mr Speaker, and thanks to the member for Bean for his question about a crucially important topic. Uh, our, future, our future growth in our economy will be determined by whether or not we get the big trends and transitions right, whether it's the energy transition, the shift to uh, the care economy and services, whether it's tech technology and how we adopt and adapt it in our economy, how we invest in our people. This will determine whether we succeed or fail in our economy in this defining decade. Uh, and how we get cleaner and cheaper and more reliable, increasingly renewable energy into the system will be absolutely central to our prospects in the years ahead. Now, the Australian people understand this and the Australian business community and investor community, as the Prime Minister said, understand this as well. Now, this side of the parliament has done more to secure the future of our energy markets in 10 months than those opposite were able to do in almost 10 years. 
We've legislated an emissions we'll reduction target, progressing our Powering Australia plan and the, the Powering Nationals. the Regions Fund, and in my own portfolio, establishing a climate risk disclosure framework and promoting sustainable finance. Now, these plans are all about providing business with the investment certainty they need to help power new industries and create new jobs, while at the same time maximising our traditional economic strengths. Now, central to this, of course, Mr. Speaker, is the safeguard mechanism, which is currently before this parliament and which has the overwhelming support of Australian business and Australian investors. The AIG, ACI, the BCA, as the Prime Minister said, all crying out for this to be passed through this place. It's also a policy supported by the Productivity Commission. The chair of the PC said yesterday the safeguard mechanism is essentially the best policy instrument available to drive reduced emissions. And here's another quote backing the safeguard mechanism. It will help Australia's largest energy-using businesses adopt new technologies that will reduce energy costs and emissions while maintaining or increasing their competitiveness. That's what the member for Hume said when he was the most embarrassing part of the former government. That's what the member for Hume said at the time. Now, Australian businesses and Australian investors can't afford for this country to see the opportunities of cleaner and cheaper, more reliable energy to continue to go back. Australians and Australian businesses have already paid too hefty a price for the wasted decade of denial and delay and dysfunction represented by those opposite. Those opposite have learned absolutely nothing from the wasted decade when it Order. comes to energy. Treasurer will resume his seat. I want to hear from the manager of opposition business. Well, Mr. Speaker, on relevance on a number of occasions you've directed and minister to be relevant to the question, uh, the question did not ask about the opposition. Did not ask about the opposition's record. The minister should be directed back to the terms of the question. I'll hear from the leader of the house. Uh, the question asked about the risks of this certainty not being provided. The opposition are that risk. <laughs> Just going to ask the order, order. Members on my right. Order. The Leader of the Opposition will cease interjecting. I'm just going to ask the, the Treasurer has had a good go. I'm just going to ask him to return back to the question. Mr Speaker, the point is this. After a wasted decade of missed opportunities in energy, Treasurer this coalition of cookers wants to put our future prosperity and our future economy at risk. The nation needs this parliament to pass the safeguard mechanism. Yeah. Give a call to the Honourable Member for McPherson. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to my constituent, Jason, from Rabina, a 35-year-old father of two who has had to take a second job and cancel his children's swimming lessons as his mortgage repayments are expected to almost double as he comes off a fixed-rate loan. He says rising grocery, energy and other price increases are a massive stress on top of the anticipated rate rise. Where is the government's promised plan to ease cost of living? Give the, call, the member for Hunter is warned. Give the call to the Prime Minister. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And I thank uh, the member for her question and uh, I thank her for her um, interview on Sky, I think it was, it usually is. Um, that was uh, that, that was that was terrific. Uh, during that uh, during that thing where she the, the the member blamed me for the fact that two people were appointed in her portfolio without letting her know while she was the minister Order. for home affairs. The member for Barker. While she was the minister for home affairs. But I but I say to the member, hang in there, hang in there. Uh, you never know what might happen. Um, I say in terms of, uh, of, of interest rates that the, uh, and, and the cost of living that uh, the member asked for. I know that she's very loyal to the Leader of the Opposition, so I'll quote him. Um, Nobody wants to see interest rates go up, but it's a reality of a world where there's inflation. I think Australians understand that. There's a lot of pressure, upward pressure on interest rates at the moment. That's what the Leader of the Opposition had to say. Uh, when he was a minister, and I think he was the only minister in his portfolio at that point in time. Uh, so obviously he had the confidence of the Prime Minister at that point in time. Uh, on that occasion, uh, he, he was right in a moment of, uh, of honest reflection as to what was happening 
uh, in the economy. We understand that there are pressures on costs of living. We understand that, which is why, uh, which is why the member for McPherson should have voted for the energy price relief, should have supported the fee-free TAFE plan, should have supported <coughs> the cut to pharmaceutical costs, should be uh, supporting the measures that this government is doing in order to take pressure off the cost of living. Call to the honourable member for McEwen. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Housing. How will the Housing Australia Future Fund benefit Australians? And how has it been received by stakeholders? And why is it so important Order. that it pass the parliament as soon as possible? Yeah. Call to the Minister for Housing, the Minister for Homelessness and the Minister for Small Business. Thanks, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for McEwen for this important question. He knows that too many Australians at the moment are making difficult decisions around their kitchen table. They're dealing with increasing interest rates, they're dealing with rising rents and they're making some tough decisions, which is why it's astounding that those opposite continue to oppose our Housing Australia Future Fund. They oppose the Housing Australia Future Fund, a reform Order. that will deliver thousands of new social and affordable homes right across Australia for people that need it most. Fortunately, Mr Speaker, they Order. sat alone when this House passed our bill, with broad support from MPs Minister across Fisher. this House, including, of course, the member for Bass, who supported this important legislation. The member for Deakin will leave and the last chamber week, under 94A. housing experts from across academia, from industry and from community gave their views to a Senate committee on our housing package. Power Housing Australia described it as, and I quote, transformative reform that will enable the housing needs of more Australians to be met, Mr Speaker. When asked if the Senate should move quickly to support the package, the Community Housing Industry Association declared it was, quote, absolutely urgent. The Housing Industry Association said, and I quote, we have to put something in place right now. The Urban rejection. Development Institute said, quote, every day that passes is costing them more and more. The Property Council said, Quote, the quicker of all of these mechanisms are up and running, the better. National Shelter described it as quote, the most critical housing legislation to be brought forward for the past 10 years. That's what people are saying Order. about our Housing Australia Future Fund and our legislation. And we have done more in our first 10 months than those opposite did in almost 10 years, particularly when it comes to social and affordable housing. Our housing accord which will combine with state and federal funding to deliver another 20,000 affordable homes over five years from 2024. We've unlocked up to $575 million immediately from the National Housing Infrastructure Facility, and construction is underway on these homes around Australia. We're working with the states and territory on the future of the $1.6 billion each year under the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement. Work is already underway on a national housing and homelessness plan. We'll implement our help to buy scheme, the shared equity scheme. We brought forward the regional home buyer guarantee that is already helping thousands of Australians into home ownership. And of course, the Industry Super Association, who just today has said the Senate to support the Housing Australia's Future Fund and the once in a generation opportunity it provides to reform investment in social and affordable housing. They are urging the Senate to pass this legislation. Our broad reforms to housing are critical, and I would say to those opposite and to the senators, Australians that need it most need this bill to be passed, and they need it passed quickly. Call to the Honourable Member for Warringah. Mr Speaker, to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, methane is 80 times more potent in capturing heat than CO2 in the first 20 years. Yes, Australia does not enforce international best practice when it comes to measurement and capture of methane. Will you support implementing international best practice in measurement and abatement of methane as I have proposed in the amendments to the safeguard mechanism? In light of the dire but clear warning in the latest IPCC <coughs> report that we are on track to catastrophic warming. The call to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Well, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for her question. And indeed, the IPCC report today does call for urgent, substantial and sub sustained emissions reduction. Methane and all are the carbon gases, Mr Speaker. All of them. And Order. Mr Speaker, that's exactly what the government intends to do, to lock in. Honourable members opposite might not like reducing emissions, but that's what the Australian people have voted for and that's what the world demands, Mr Speaker. 
That's what the world Order. demands, and that's what future generations demand, and that's exactly what we will do. Because, Mr. Speaker, what the IPCC report today reminds us is that there is agency and urgency. There is still time to hold the world as close as possible to 1.5 degrees, but we don't have long. We must act. And, Mr. Speaker, this week the Parliament can act because in 100 days the safeguard mechanism reforms can be in place if the parliament approves them. This is the most important opportunity we have. 205 million tonnes of emissions removed from the atmosphere if the safeguard mechanism reforms pass. I know honourable members have raised fossil fuels and resources. Today, as we speak, emissions from fossil fuel facilities covered by the safeguards system are 73 million tonnes a year. Business as usual, with no reforms, they are projected to grow to 83 million tonnes a year, Mr Speaker. But if the reforms pass, it will be net 52 million tonnes, Mr Speaker. That's the choice the Parliament has—83 million or 52. That's the choice the Parliament has this week and next week. And I'll say this. Last year, the Parliament passed the Government's Climate Change Act. And I thank members of the crossbench, all of them who supported it, and in the other place. This was important. And some honourable members opposite said, 43 is not enough. And I understand that and respect that. I respect their point of view and I thank them for coming together in goodwill to pass that. But know this. Our projections are very clear. If the safeguard mechanism reforms are not passed, 43 per cent will not be met. Our projections show it will be 35 per cent, Mr Speaker. So if honourable members are going to call for higher targets, they are obliged to vote for action to get those targets Order. achieved, Mr. The, Speaker. The minister that is the obligation, honourable members. You can't call for higher targets. The, mem the, mem the minister will pause. The member for right. I want to hear from the member for Warringah on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On relevance, the question did go to methane specifically. I'm going to ask the order. I'm going to ask the, the minister to return. To the question, it was a specific question, and I bring the minister back to the question. I do want to, to see question. methane emissions reduced. I do. I want to see all carbon emissions reduced, Mr. Speaker. That's why I want to see the, carb, the safeguards mechanism reforms passed. I know this: there will be no constraint on methane. There will be no constraint on CO2. There will be no constraint on any carbon gases unless the safeguard reforms pass the parliament this fortnight. That's the case. Now, the honourable member is correct. Methane is a very important gas for us to measure and to work with industry to see emissions redu reduced. That is very important. And if there are good faith suggestions, I have and will continue to listen to them. But the most important thing is that these reforms pass or to be business as usual, and business as usual is not acceptable. Yeah. The call to the member for Lingiari. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Social Services. Minister, what is the Albanese Labor government doing to increase crisis and emergency accommodation for women and children leaving family and domestic violence. Why is urgent action needed? Give, give a call to the Minister for Social Services. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member for her question and, of course, for her ongoing advocacy uh, for her community but communities right around Australia when it comes to domestic and family violence. Of course, domestic and family violence is the main reason women and children leave their homes in Australia and is the leading cause of homelessness for children. Women shouldn't have to choose between being homeless or being in an environment that is dangerous to her or her children. The government is progressing significant investment to increase the availability of crisis accommodation through the Safe Places Emergency Accommodation Program. Through the October budget, uh, the government committed $100 million of extra funding to deliver 720 additional safe places for women and children leaving violent situations. And work is underway at the moment with partners that will partner with the government in this, including family and domestic violence services, state and territory governments and, importantly, victim survivors. Of course, this new round will seek to specifically help uh, those that may have an increased risk of experiencing domestic and family violence, including women living with disability and First Nations women. 
Of course, this uh, is a significant investment, but it's not the only investment that our government's making. Of course, the Housing Australia Future Fund will deliver the Albanese government's election commitment of 30,000 new social and affordable homes in, this fu in its fund's first five years. The allocation of 4,000 houses uh, and $100 million from the returns of the Housing Australia Future Fund will complement the Safe Places program, providing affordable housing for women and children affected by family violence, older women and women at risk of homelessness. So it is important that the legislation to create this fund passes the parliament. Those who are delaying the passage of legislation are delaying these homes being built. The opposition and the Greens must support us on this measure that will help millions of Australians. Housing for women and children escaping violence should be above politics. We should be able to put our politics aside and get on with the job. I urge everyone in this place and in the other place to support this legislation so we can have action now. Yeah. Call the Honourable Member Petrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. 81-year-old Kazik lives with his 78-year-old wife Tatiana in Griffin, within my electorate of Petrie. Kazik and Tatiana's latest gas bill is 72% higher than their previous bill. 72% higher. These increases mean they'll have to make difficult decisions this winter, whether to eat or whether to stay warm. Why do Australian families, Mr Speaker, always pay more under Labor? Give the call to the Prime Minister. The member for Lyons is warned. I, 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 I thank the member for Petrie for his question, which goes to the price of gas, where we had a vote on it in this parliament. You voted against a price cap on gas of, of $12. You voted against that. And you also Order. voted against providing assistance of $1.5 billion. And you also voted against the safeguard mechanism, or you've indicated you're going to vote against the safeguard mechanism, which business is saying is absolutely essential to create investment in the energy sector so that we drive down prices due to supply demand issues. They're saying that they desperately want that, that signal which was established by Remember the former government. But uh, those opposite uh, can't vote against assistance for people and then, then tell them that they want to support them. Because the truth is, if you wanted to do that, you could have voted for the support right. that was in here when we resumed Parliament right. in, in January. Just like in another place, in another place in New South Wales, the Coalition and Labor all voted for lower power prices to their credit. Together. That's what a responsible opposition did. You were an irresponsible opposition and just opposed it for its own sake. Call to the member for McNamara. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Why is it important to condemn public displays of right-wing extremism and Nazi symbolism? Yeah. I give the call to the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for McNamara for his question. I acknowledge his recent statements on this matter. What we saw on the steps of the Victorian Parliament on the weekend was abhorrent. There is no place in Australian society for public displays of Nazi symbols or the Nazi salute. These are markers of some of the darkest days in the world's history, of ghettos, of deportations and mass murder that touched my own family. Six million Jews perished in the Holocaust. We must never ever forget. And thousands of Australian servicemen and women died fighting the Nazi regime. Sadly, the sort of behaviour we saw on the weekend and its accompanying anti-Semitism is on the rise in Australia and around the world. The Victorian government was swift in its response. 
The Premier condemned the behaviour of a group of cowardly black-clad men who travelled to Melbourne CBD seeking notoriety. The Victorian Attorney-General pledged to reform Victorian law to ban displays of the Nazi salute. And when it was revealed that Victorian Liberal MP Moira Deeming had attended the protest, the Victorian opposition leader announced that he would move to expel Ms Deeming from the Liberal Party. But what have we had from those opposite, in particular their leader? Complete silence, Mr Speaker. We all know that bigotry and hatred breed in silence. The order, the Attorney General has paused. The member for the member for River Arena, also is objecting. I'd like to hear from the member for Wannan, and it's got to be on a point of order. A point of order. What the Attorney General has said is absolutely false. Yeah. It's not a. It's not a point of order. But I'm just going to call the Attorney General. The Leader of the Opposition has failed to join his Victorian counterpart and take action to expel Ms Deeming from his party. He has failed to condemn the display of the Nazi salute on the steps of the Victorian Parliament. He has been invisible since the weekend. He has done no media. Why, Mr Speaker? What is so hard about this? Who is the Opposition Leader afraid of offending here? Maybe it's Senator Antic, who said in the Senate yesterday, Moira did nothing wrong. For the leader of a party of government to not even condemn the public use of the Nazi salute is astonishing and it is shameful. The leader of the opposition is the most senior Liberal in Australia. Moira Deeming is one of his own and he's been silent and he's done nothing. This speaks volumes about the leadership qualities of the leader of the opposition, Mr Speaker and Australians will take note. The Leader of the Opposition has sought indulgence. It's I'm going to give him the call. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Well, I want to uh, join with the Attorney-General uh, in the remarks that he's made uh, so far as they go to condemnation of any use of Nazi symbols of the salute, uh, of any uh, glorification of that period of history. I would support any legislation in this parliament that you choose to move, noting that you've not chosen to move any legislation, to, Minister for to make illegal in our country the display of any aspect of Nazi glorification. I find the response today to be quite remarkable and over the top, Mr Speaker, to use Order. to political advantage this issue. Order. Yeah. I've been in this place for 22 years. You can look at my history in every comment that I've made in relation to making sure that uh, we never ever repeat the mistakes of history, particularly during that period. And the slaughter, the slaughter of Jews and the treatment by the Nazis of people during the Second World War, the treatment today of people of the Jewish faith is an abomination. And it is equally condemned in that it would be used for political purposes in this place as a very, very poor reflection on you, if I might say. So, Mr Speaker, as Minister for Home Affairs and as the Minister for Defence, as a member of the National Security Committee, I supported every decision, in fact encouraged to the nth degree the Director General of ASIO Never to use every resource at his disposal to make sure that those who would seek to propagate this hatred should be charged according to the law. And I won't take a morals lecture from that man or indeed that one. Yeah. Just to get up and make the statement himself. Your seat. Order. The House will come. The House will come. The the Leader of the Opposition the Leader of the Opposition will seek the Member for Jellybrand. The Member for Jellybrand is warned. The House will come to complete silence. That includes the Leader of the Opposition immediately. I want to hear from the Member for Indi in complete silence. There is one more interjection.
People will leave this chamber. I give the call to the member for Indi. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communications. My constituents battle with poor phone reception every day. Last weekend, over 2,000 people attended the Swan Pool Motor Festival and struggled to get mobile phone and internet access. Event Emergency Coordinator Ross Coles asked me, if there had been an emergency, what would we have done? This isn't good enough. Can you guarantee with, that with the mobile black spot program that opened yesterday, critical black spots in rural and regional Australia like this will be fixed? Give a call to the Minister for Communications. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Indi for her question. And she, of course, is a very strong advocate in terms of ensuring that her constituents have equitable levels of communications as compared to their metropolitan cousins. And the member raises two really critical issues. The first is in terms of public health and safety when it comes to communications. And that, of course, is paramount. As more and more people rely on mobile communications, it has never been more important. And secondly, in terms of the tourism and other small and micro business opportunities that the best mobile services and also broadband services, of course, can provide. And I am aware that she is acutely interested in these issues. So I'm very pleased to inform her that, as she rightly points out, yesterday applications opened for two new funding programs of $150 million of federal co-investments, and they include four mobile black spots. And the Albanese government believes that, irrespective of where you live in this great country, everyone deserves the best Order. access to communication services. So, in particular, I point out left. in relation to the member's question, the mobile black spot and regional connectivity grants unleash new opportunities for mobile infrastructure in remote and very remote parts of Australia, particularly, as I'm sure many other members will be interested, in First Nations communities, because they offer additional financial solutions targeting these very underserved areas. And this is in response to feedback that previous schemes did not provide enough incentive for this. So the guidelines that we consulted on from December last year to February this year really sought to improve a number of those elements that had been lacking in previous rounds. Applications are open until the 31st of May, and I encourage mobile network operators, communities and other interested parties, including all members of this place with rural and regional representation, to work together during what we call the application development period to devise multi-carrier solutions, including ones that utilise sharing technologies. Because again, as the member will be well aware, one of the real frustrations in regional Australia is the patchwork of coverage depending on who your carrier is at any given point. But unfortunately, under the previous rounds, under the former government, only 8 per cent of the mobile black spot program towers actually provided support to more than one carrier. We have changed the incentives in the guidelines so that this is substantially improved. So the guidelines in this round emphasise that support for multi-carrier outcomes to ensure that communities receive the maximum benefit from that public funding. And these programs, of course, provide part of the most significant regional telecommunications investment packages since the inception of the MBN and the Albanese government's better connectivity plan for regional rural Australia providing more than $1.1 billion to regional communities, and I look forward to the member's full participation in this program. The Minister's time has concluded. I give the call to the member for Reid. Yeah. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Trade and Tourism. What were the key outcomes from the Minister's recent visit to India, and how will this benefit Australian exporters seeking to diversify their trade? I give the call to the Minister representing the Minister for Trade and Tourism. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member for Reid for her question and recognise that in her electorate there is a vibrant and growing uh, Indian Australian community. When I travelled uh, to India with the Prime Minister and the Minister for Trade recently, our message was clear. A stronger India Australia partnership is good for the stability of our region. It also means more opportunities and more trade and investment and mutually strengthening our economies and directly benefiting our communities. 
India is a key trade diversification market for Australian exporters, and India sees Australia as key to their trade diversification aspirations. Today, Australia and India have around $46 billion in two-way <laughs> trade each year, and we have a shared ambition to boost our trading relationship to around $100 billion each year. The Albanese Labor government is working hard to make this happen. Labor's Trade Minister, Minister Senator Farrell, ensured the Australia-India Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement was ratified by this parliament in November last year. The urgency of this Labor government to put AECTA in place means that tariffs on around 85 per cent of Australia's exports to India have been cut to zero. And in the month of January this year, Australian businesses benefited from tariff cuts on over $2.5 billion worth of exports to India. But we can and we must go further. A key outcome from our recent visit to India was to make further progress on our next free trade agreement with India, a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement. Both Prime Minister Albanese and Prime Minister Modi agreed to make swift progress in negotiations and for an early conclusion of this ambitious trade agreement. And both our trade ministers did the same thing. Another outcome was an excellent meeting with the Honourable Minister for Commerce and Industry, uh, Mr Piyash Goyal, uh, alongside with the Trade and Tourism Minister. And I thank Minister Goyal for his wholehearted engagement. Minister Goyal joined the Taste of Australia event and introduced me and the Trade Minister to the world-famous double wallas that deliver tiffins right across Mumbai. Uh, while we had the important opportunity to introduce uh, and promote uh, Geraldton crayfish to the massive market that India represents. It's a very important market and I acknowledge how important this is to the member for Durak and the Fisher people in her electorate. And this is a very important outcome indeed. By working together, our two nations will grow employment opportunities, raise living standards and improve the general welfare in both countries while we deepen economic ties. Deeper economic ties with India means more opportunities for Australian business to diversify their trade, and more trade means more and higher paying jobs for Australian workers. The Albanese Labor government will continue to work with India to progress our trade relations well into the future for the benefit of both of our nations. Give a call to the member for Hughes. My question is to the Prime Minister. On Sunday, the 12th of March, Caruso's Italian restaurant, an institution in the Sutherland Shire, was forced to close its doors permanently. Owners Rocky and Karen Pitarelli have cited rising electricity costs, rising labour costs and staff shortages as reasons for their closure. Prime Minister, why do Australian families and businesses always pay more under labour? I give the call to the Prime Minister. Uh, I thank the member for Hughes for her question. And indeed, it is uh, very regretful that any small business uh, closes uh, Caruso's restaurant. In, the Leader in, uh, of the Opposition, I cannot hear what the Prime Minister is saying. Order. The Prime Minister will return to the question and he has the call. And that is why we are conscious of these issues. That is precisely why. We have taken action to take the sting out of power prices and to make sure that the legislation that is before the parliament at the moment, the safeguard mechanism, is also aimed at promoting investment in the energy sector. The business community say that that is the case. But I hope that the member for Hughes is also regretting voting against the $1.5 billion in direct bill relief. I hope that the member for Hughes uh, regrets voting against price caps on gas. Uh, fortunately, the Liberal representatives in New South Wales did vote for price caps on energy, along with the Labor opposition in New South Wales. The truth is that we were left with an energy grid built for the last century—22 energy policies—and didn't land a single one. Not one. Not one. We are paying the price for a decade of neglect, but this government is determined to act. That's why we have legislation before this parliament, and I'd encourage the member for Hughes to vote for that legislation and vote for, therefore, an increase, an increase in the supply of energy, which will have an impact. And, and you had the opportunity to vote for lower prices last December, and you chose to the vote against member it. Member for Hume will cease interjecting. 
Could we call to the member for Jagger Jagger? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Today marks the 10th anniversary of the national apology for forced adoptions. Why was the apology necessary, and why is it still important 10 years later? Call to the Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, 10 years ago today, on behalf of the government and the people of Australia, Prime Minister Julia Gillard said sorry to all those affected by forced adoptions. Tonight, there will be a commemorative dinner at the National Portrait Gallery for those affected by these experiences. And tomorrow, the Minister for Social Services will deliver a statement in the chamber. Mr Speaker, the national apology offered on 21 March 2013 was an honest, humble and long overdue acknowledgement of the harm and loss and grief and trauma inflicted on mothers separated from their children and children separated from their mothers. It hailed, as we do today, those affected who fought so hard for the justice they were due, and it recognised, as we do today, those who did not live to see the truth told. Mr Speaker, Prime Minister Gillard's speech also dealt unflinchingly and sparingly with what drove and allowed that separation. In Julia's words, holding the mirror to ourselves, reflecting on the imagined moral superiority which inflicted its judgment and its cruelty on vulnerable people. Today again, we remember their suffering and loss, and we reflect on a culture that enabled and facilitated the practice of denying mothers even a single moment with the baby that they had brought into the world. As Prime Minister Gillard said, they did not see their baby's face. They couldn't soothe his or her first cries, never felt her warmth or smelt her skin. They could not give their own baby a name. And this is not ancient history, not some distant tale from the vanished past. The Australians affected are with us still from two generations. Mothers who, through the years, paused in quiet moments to think of a child who would be taking her first steps or waving at the gate for his first day of school or beaming proudly on graduation day. And children who were left uncertain as to how their path on life's journey began. Mr Speaker, today, a decade on, we pay tribute to all those who, in the face of decades of callous indifference, demanded that the people of Australia apologise for the harm that was done in their name. We remember those whose lives were cut short, who did not live to witness that moment of healing. We salute the leadership of Julia Gillard and the advocacy of Jenny Macklin and those such as Steve Irons, who played such an important role in those events of 10 years ago. And we vow to heed the lessons of this chapter in our nation's history, to reach for empathy, humility and humanity before we leap to judgment. And to remember that strength in leadership is not defined simply by the exercise of power. Strength is about accountability and telling the truth, even when that truth is uncomfortable or hard to bear. Long may Australia remember this anniversary, which will be commemorated this evening with the dinner, and then we in the parliament tomorrow will commemorate it across both sides of this chamber. But long may we honour those who, even though it was so difficult for them, uh, gave us one of the finest moments in this parliament's history. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I want to associate the coalition uh, with the fine words of the Prime Minister. Uh, it was a proud day for this parliament that we were able to stop, to pause, to apologise, to recognise and reflect on the history, the impact that it's had on generations of Australians, many of whom will still suffer today with those scars, the impacts on their own relationships, their own children and their the psychological impact uh, just can't be underestimated and the work has Prime Minister points out of, uh, of many people in this parliament, but including Prime Minister Gillard as well as uh, Minister Macklin and Steve Irons, uh, Prime Minister uh, then uh, well, Scott Morrison, uh, later to be Prime Minister, and many others who were involved uh, in making sure that uh, the parliament dealt with this in a respectful way. And uh, there are many um, who are still involved in that fight and still seeking to 
make a connection and it is uh, a, a torture for them ongoing and we really respect those and we'll have more to say on the topic in the parliament tomorrow. Call the Prime Minister. Thanks, Mr Speaker. I ask further questions to be placed on the notice paper and seek your indulgence. Prime Minister has the call.